Brad, welcome to this video interview. Back when we did an HPT video uh, in January 2022, we had a side conversation about some of the things that uh, you had read from me, books or articles and such, and if I call, recall correctly. And uh, I was interested in what you had taken and adopted as is, as I kind of presented it, and what you might have adapted and more importantly, why you adapted it and how you adapted it. So that kind of begins our our the setup for this particular video interview. Um, but before we get into that, can you give us a little bit of your background in learning and development and, and what you're doing right now? Uh, sure thing. So hello, Guy. And uh, as I said before, it's a pleasure to be here. Always a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, my background is uh, I was uh, I was in our Royal Canadian Navy for uh, about 29 years. I started off my career as an operational officer at sea uh, in warfare. And around 2005, 2006, I changed my occupations to what we call training development officer in our in our Navy and our forces. So that's when I took my first instructional systems design course. In fact, I think it was 2006 and I graduated in 2007. That was after taking some time off from the Navy a little bit before to do a Bachelor of Education. So I kind of had about two or three years of solid education and then instructional systems design type of, uh, type of uh, learning. Uh, so that took me all the way through until about 2018 when I, my last posting uh, in the Navy was as uh, the, the lead for uh, future, future plans for our Navy, looking at uh, uh, creating a concept of operations for how the Navy training system would operate in the future. I then left in 2021 in May and I joined a company called Fleetway Incorporated. And uh, Fleetway is uh, a company that is closely aligned to Irving Shipbuilding. And so on the one hand of the company, Irving Shipbuilding builds the ships and maintains the ships. And then Fleetway, which is a separate company, but aligned, as I said, uh, we do all the support engineering and also the all the training services uh, related to new ship builds. So this is what I'm doing right now. I'm the program manager for training programs for Fleetway. Well, thank you for that background because of the <clears throat> it's interesting you've had, you know, one foot in the educational realm, so to speak, and another one in the training realm. Um, and you're, you're kind of using that old school term training, which, you know, I, I certainly get and everything today is, now, is sometimes called learning. Um, but, but nonetheless, uh, so, so in our prior discussions leading up to this recording, you said that there were a couple of things that you could talk to about things that I've written or shared in articles or books. And so can you kick us off with, you know, what are some of those things that you'll talk about and, and share with us, you know, what you might have adopted and, and what you had to adapt, why, and, and how you might have made that adaption? Because I'm, I think that's, I've been doing that my entire career. I've been borrowing mm -hmm. things from others that I've uh, read or, or witnessed them in doing presentations or private discussions and I kind of folded that into my own methodology set. And so I found, I realized after decades of doing this that I was really adapting mostly and adopting some things. But but what have you got for us today? Is it, yeah, so I, I agree with you. I think, I don't know if everything is totally adopted or, or totally adapted. It's probably somewhere on that spectrum. And, and I, I think when we talk about a few things today, we're going to find out that there are little bits and pieces that we tweak. But I also agree with you. 99% of what we do is, is probably not our own kind of completely original thought. We are always kind of using, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants, so to speak. So a few of the things I thought I would talk about today uh, are as follows. I'm, I'm going to talk about the, the clock face or the tiered model of the L&D function, kind of overall, and, and a few of the ways that I've used that around this, this particular company to organize how we do business and talk about, talk to our leadership. Uh, the next would be uh, really the book called Assessing the L&D Function. So we can talk about how I used that book and kind of the process that, that we followed to really open up the eyes of myself and some of the folks on our team. And, uh, and then one of the other things I want to talk about is, is uh, 
is really kind of analysis, that analysis phase, in particular, some specific examples of uh, what, what I think you would call the MCD phase two. Um, and, and then, you know, there's probably a bunch, bunch of things in around all that discussion that we will we'll dig into, hopefully not too many rabbit holes, but. Well, that's fine. So thank you. So, so let's start. So the clock face model, what, uh, where did you see that? What did you take away from that? What have you done with it? Okay. So when last we spoke, I think I explained that the, the team that I had was a team of experts, but a small team, folks who come from different industries. Um, and I had a, I had a task in front of me, which is kind of build the team and then make this team function. And we have a huge task ahead of us, particularly with this next Canadian surface combatant, which is a, a, based on the, the, the British Type 26 model. So a very, a very big, multi-purpose, very highly capable destroyer-sized frigate and all the crew and people training that goes around that. Um, so one of, the, one of the first things I made a, 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 an attempt to do within this company is to really solidify what our processes were. So tell people how we do business. You know, I'm a big believer in say what you do and do what you say. And so we were doing a lot and we were gonna to continue to do a lot, but we really weren't saying what we were doing. So we wanted to nail that down. Um, so I, that clock face model, and of course that the tiered model that has kind of the, I always call them chiclets with my team, but the, you know, the, yeah. the little, the separate functions. <laughs> the little boxes, um, yeah, on the truck. The little boxes uh, came in handy and it came in handy for uh, for a couple of reasons. One is, is down into the team, right? So, um, and this is going to come up when we talk about uh, when we talk about assessing the LD function, but I'll bring it up now anyways, is that a lot of folks in both the, the military kind of training design development world and the and the industry in the industry design development world are really focused on development. So you really see in in the clock face model or the tiered model, it's that it's that center bit of those core functions that, that we do. And some of us do it better than others. Some of us have more experience in, in other areas than others, but we kind of don't always look at the, the, the leadership level and we don't always look at that supporting level below. Um, so so I, I, I brought that into the, to the team and we were able to get our heads wrapped around, okay, what it is we actually have to do. The, the other thing that we did is, we, is we, I took that model and I, and I used it as a, uh, a kind of a, a graphic to, to speak to with leadership. So leadership, <clears throat> and I think I think a lot of folks in the training world will understand when I say this, is that in the in the training, learning, education world or performance world, we often think of you know, the leaders of the companies or maybe some of our customers even as oh, they just don't get it. They just don't understand what I'm talking about. This is important stuff, right? Well, that's because sometimes we sit in that middle that middle round a lot. We sit in that kind of analysis, design, development, almost kind of, you know, that old fashioned Addy, you know, that Addy realm. We don't sit in that, hey, how do we actually plan out the process? How do we actually bring together all the financial pieces and the contractual pieces to get that together? So using that model, I was able to talk to my leadership and really get them on board with what we were doing to show them where, hey, this fits into the business. This isn't just a task that I've got to go and train you know a couple thousand sailors uh, for each ship's company for for a ship here this actually fits into the business in a way that is aligned to the rest of the business and so i think you know i'll just riff off of that a little bit that model actually helped me then you know it comes back you know i'm, I'm working with my team i'm working with my leadership but then i learn things as well so that fitting into the business piece you know what is it and, and i know you talk about this and a lot of the work you do is so does this fit with the organization's business goals? Does it meet the objectives of the organization, whether that be the client, in this case, Canada and the Navy, or that be our business? And when we when we when we look at, uh, at those different functions, we I can align that together. I can say, OK, there's a planning function here. I need to talk to the planners who are working in technical publications or in ILS and supportability or in Canada, translation. So we have a, our company has a translation uh, kind of sub-business that, that, we, that we work with. And, and in Canada, of course, everything we produce 
has to be both in French and English. So I've got to, I've got to include all those people. So what that model does for me is it lets me know as a leader of, of training programs, other folks that I have to go talk to and, 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 and include in my planning as well. Um, yeah, I think, I think that kind of, so did I get into adapt or adopt? I think that was more. <laughs> well, like, I, I yeah. Think I, I think you said how you use that. So, so part of what I, when I think about adopting and adapting, the adaptation is usually around language and the configuration of, of imagery, if you will. So, you know, you talked about the three tiers, the top tier mm -hmm. is leadership, uh, systems or subsystems, and systems to me are always processes. So every chiclet or, or box on that diagram has a number of processes and, you know, the division of processes from one big one with a whole bunch of branching in it or whatever, uh, where it stops and ends. It's all kind of arbitrary. So I might say, here's four processes. You may have seen it as two. Um, but that core area, that's, yeah, that's where, you know, L&D professionals, training and development professionals live. That's what they do. It's their leadership that really has to contend with and 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 use the processes or established processes i think for the leadership tier the core tier everybody's involved in in the lnd or training and development function uh to one extent or another but that's where the practitioners live the developers the designers the analysts etc and that that bottom tier support you know that's there to help uh middle managers if you will that's how i saw it anyway when i first created this back in the 80s um, was to uh, allow them to, to look at their processes, to continuously improve their processes, create them where they don't exist, uh, do the hiring and firing of people and the development and training of their own people, putting the infrastructure in place that's necessary. And then mm -hmm. the last box on the whole model, there is, you know, special assignments, you know, as a sign, because everybody I've ever dealt with always had, you know, something that didn't quite fit their, their functional responsibilities, but were other duties such as, you know, maybe supporting recruiting or whatever. But, but mm -hmm. so what, what, what kinds of things did you have to change or find a, a necessary or, or, or helpful to change in terms of language and that imagery? Okay. <laughs> Where do I start now? Uh, <laughs> I kind of, I kind of wish now I had some of the, some of the actual diagrams and uh, up, up, but I, it, it would take too long to find them at this point. Um, I think, uh, <clears throat> what did I have to change? There were some things that I could cut, cut out of it completely. Okay, so. Maybe let's talk about what I've included fully, partially, or okay. or cut out completely. So things like things like HR. There's a lot of the HR processes that for our company is is you know we're we're obviously uh, there's a good relationship with our HR team and along the whole path of hiring and things like that. But a lot of that is really not up to me. So I, I work with people on the financial side. That's another piece. So I guess you know uh, the the. There are, there are certain parts of the way we do our finances that I, I don't have a lot of, of say in, right? Right. So there were some, those things I would say largely cut out. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that we're not doing financial management and things like that, but there's some more details there. Um, the things that we've probably a, adopted more fully are, as I said, in that, in that middle, all of those core processes. I will say, though, that I have divided up that middle line into two distinct levels. And uh, I believe, and, and don't quote me on this, but I think you you actually cover this in some of your other work, but there's there's a strategic level of those core design processes, those core processes where, you know, it's probably it's probably me working with the customer, working with other customers and, and the other folks who are part of the uh, of the industry kind of partnerships that are working on this particular example that I've been talking about, can you service combat, where we will, we will operate at a strategic level, doing that analysis, high level design, and then not so much strategic and development, but 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 those probably those two areas where you're you're really you're really you know putting that strategy together, and then each subset of that will be ha have its have its kind of in, in military terms operational or tactical level. So that tactical level of you know the MCD phases and things like that for each specific subsystem or mission or something like that. So I've I've divided those into two, uh, at least in my mind, and in some of the graphics I've created, where we engage at a strat level, 
and then we engage with the customer at each specific level. Um, yeah. So let, let yeah. me let me interrupt for a second here. So MCD modular curriculum development slash acquisition. That's my that's my adaptation of Addy from back in the early 80s and 82 when I became a consultant. I, I framed my own Addy like process so that I could plan projects, price projects, uh, manage projects through their life cycle. And the and so that yeah, that's that's very tactical most of the time, at least the the bulk of it. The front end of it, which can overlap with the strategic level, which I would call curriculum architecture. Now, I've been changing some mm -hmm. of my language just last year. Curriculum architecture design has become uh, architectural, uh, instructional architecture. And the MCD modular curriculum design, the ADDIE level is instructional development. I I've kind of gravitated back to the term instruction because to me, it's inclusive of uh, performance guides known as job age or performance support and learning experiences, which in the old days was training or courses or whatever language people needed to use. But instruction seems to be a term that's all inclusive of those two routes to trying to impact performance. But I, but I agree. So I like that, that you've, you've divided it up in, from a strategic level. Uh, kind of, you know, figuring out what could be, what should be, and then at a tactical level, putting it in place, standing it up, uh, revising whatever you've already got or creating or buying things uh, from scratch. To be fair to you, Guy, I just actually just got out to conducting performance analysis, which is which is okay. another one of your books. It's, it, to be fair to you, in fact, it is it is curriculum architecture design is the term I'm, I'm using. So I've, I have a, I have a adopted that full scale for that strategic right. level uh not necessarily we don't use mcd in our uh in our discourse in our company so that's probably more of an uh, an adaptation of what mm -hmm. of what you've done um and actually that i'm probably trending into the third thing that i really that we really wanted to talk about which which is that which is the is the addy model so you you just you just explained to us that you developed mcd in the early 1980s so we're 40 years later Right. Yeah. Pretty much 40 years later. And, and here I am using MCD. And then there was this even earlier model that's based on a whole bunch of stuff. Some people argue in the 1950s kind of defense uh, world, but we added, you know, yeah. so when I and this is no what I'm about to say is not a criticism of, of anyone on my team. I have I have a, actually a phenomenal team. I I. <laughs> I love going to work every day and working with these folks because they just bring so much to the table. But I do find that uh, many of the people who are attracted to any of the job openings we have or, or people with experience in training, everyone, including myself, we always go back to the Addy model. That's, that's, it's just, it is what it is. And folks in college courses and university courses, anyone touching on structural systems design, you might hear a few a few kind of little changes, you know, sometimes that they, they, they work in program planning, but really they're talking about adding when it comes to training, things like that. So we, we, I've used assessing the LND, if I keep looking at the back of my, my, uh, my bookshelf here, we've used <laughs> assessing the LND function uh, as, as a process. Uh, I've used, I brought that into the team. And what we've been able to do is use that to, uh, I was going to say combat against something, but that's not really what we're doing. We're opening eyes. We're saying, hey, everyone is bringing something to the team here. Uh, this person may have worked in higher education as a consultant that, uh, in fact, I've got a great person on my team who was a consultant in higher ed, helping university and college professors improve their instruction. Uh, we've got other folks who come from the kind of military industrial world where people are generating content for equipment. And all, all of those folks in between. And then when you when you look at assessing the LND function, and I I, rec I have recommended this book a hundred times to people. Okay, so I hear I'm, we're advertising here for you. The uh, the uh, it 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 allows you to say, okay, in this in all of these things that I'm assessing, I do this. This is where I fit, and I'm good at that. But it also lets you lets you understand. Oh, actually. I didn't know I should be doing that, or I, I kind of knew, I always knew I should be doing this or the other thing, but I've kind of glossed over it because guess what? I'm concentrating on content development or something like that. So it's a, it's a great piece of work to actually um, 
open people's eyes to what else is out there. And that's a, it's a conversation starter. Cause after that, when you start to dig into some of the things that are really should be priorities for you, um, you, you, you can bring people along for the ride and people say, you know what, I didn't get that at first, but I, now I understand why this is important. Um, it's also a great, it's also a great piece of work because it really summarizes a whole bunch of the work you've done, right? Not in the best possible way, but it really is, it, it, it follows the spectrum. So I've used that book. I, that's, a, that's an adoption and complete adoption. I mean, I literally bought a couple copies of the book and said to the team, go read this, right? Go flip through this and look at, look at the forms to the point where uh, at one point I actually recreated some of the forms for myself um, just very few, very few tweaks, but almost, almost word for word and had the team go through that. Um, well, just so you know, I don't mind anybody taking that kind of stuff and, and mm -hmm. adopting it, uh, uh, and, and adapting it, adapting it to the language of their business, because then it's going to resonate, not just with you and your team, but with your customers, if they look at that. But, but so, so the assessment follows that clock face model, which basically just for the, the audience here, I have, I divided uh, back in 2001, I wrote a book training and development systems view. And that's what the book, that book was about. And what the book you're referring to is an update from uh, last year uh, 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 about the same thing. So I just kind of refreshed it and changed some of the language and all that. But the whole point of it was uh, as a process oriented person, I got that from the quality movement back in the late seventies and early eighties. I wanted to see things as processes. And I had a project with AT&T network systems, the old Western electric manufacturing arm of AT&T. And my client wanted to take a process view of their training function. And um, and so, you know, we, we had Addy in there and they had uh, done work with me on curriculum architecture design. So that was part of it, the core piece. But there were these other aspects. And so the, the original model, the original clock face model kind of came from that effort, which was kind of in the latter part of the 1980s. And the point of the clock face, well, rather than in the tiered model, was the clock face, you could say, you know, there's outputs from nine o'clock that go into two o'clock. And there's mm -hmm. outputs from two o'clock that then go into four o'clock. And so the clock face just happened to be 12. You know, I did that kind of deliberately, shuffled things around because I've got a different version of it that's got 14 subsets of, if you will. But processes <laughs> produce outputs, which are inputs uh, elsewhere, downstream. And so my my point of this was to say here, you know, like Ricochet Rabbit, here's how things bounce around within training and development or L&D. And here's where they go outside to the customer, which is can be internal to your enterprise or external. So there's so my, my goal was to help my clients look at their own processes so they could assess them. And I've been accused in the past of, you know, promoting, you know, hey, everything, every process should be at the Six Sigma level. And I do not believe in that. My intent for this was to allow people to assess their organization, to pinpoint, to identify, and give name to their pain or their opportunities. So problem or opportunities, issues, if you will. So they could say, here's the priorities. We, we shouldn't work on everything all at once. We should work on these things first, these things next, and maybe these other things never, because the cost to address them and fix them has a, has a negative return on investment. So we'll just live with some things that aren't perfect or at Six Sigma level. Um, but anyway, so that's a little of the background of that. So when you did this assessment, we, how did you go about doing the assessment? Everybody just kind of, did you do it as a team? Did you did you share the, any of that with, with your management or, or tell me a little bit more about that? So I will admit to you, and, and my team's probably gonna be watching this video. So this sure. is- <laughs> so, exactly. So I I did the assessment myself in private first. Okay. And that was an important thing for me to do without going to the team, without even showing them the book first. I did the assessment myself because I knew that there were going to be some hard truths I had to face. Um, now, have we addressed all of those hard truths yet? Probably not. We're still we're still building. But it was important for me, and I and I would recommend to any leader who, are, if you're leading a team in L and D, you do this first, and then I recommend that you put that aside, and you then engage your team. Now, I I 
I have not gone through top to bottom every single step with my team. What I did is I kind of highlighted certain areas, gave them the book, showed them where it was, they could read it themselves. And then I've addressed certain pinpoint areas. But in doing that, in doing that engagement after that, I've, I've learned certain things. Okay, a couple things I've learned. I got, I got a few people on the team who I didn't know actually had expertise in certain areas that I wasn't accounting for. So when I did it myself, I thought, oh my gosh, you know, great panic about one thing or another. And I, and pardon me, but it's been about a year since I did it. So I, I, I did not review my notes before the interview. I couldn't pinpoint one area, but there was a few points where I said to myself, geez, I like, we're, I, I don't know if we even have the expertise on the team to do something like this, but I've ple been pleasantly surprised. And I'm continually pleasantly surprised by the teams. People, people will bring this, bring this experience with them. Stuff I didn't know they they could do because I just hadn't asked them to do. Um, you you talked about leadership, so yeah. Um, going back to the first part of the interview, when I when I started to engage the leadership with the clock face and the tiered model to have these discussions with them, um, I also was using uh experience from having assessed the lnd function saying geez we're not good in this area or maybe we have a weakness in this area uh and and this is why i've assessed it we have work to do link it to the requirements for the work that's you know in in our world this is what we have to do you know we've got to we've got to trace everything to something we're required to do um so i've said you know we're required to do x y or z whether that be maybe uh let me just think about something. Let's think of a good example. Cost benefit analysis for training media. Let's talk about that for a second. So, you know, we're required to show our customer when we make a recommendation for a certain type of media or technology that we've done a cost benefit analysis. Um, you know, we, we have folks on the team who know how to do cost benefit analysis. We've got different models. The Canadian government uses a model. Our business uses certain cost benefit analysis models for, for engineering work and things like that. But of course, we didn't necessarily have that set up for training. So you can see in the tiered model, there's there's reference to strategic planning. I mentioned finance before, so that's not us. But of course, the cost of training that is us. Um, and then if you do your if if you analyze your business or what you're doing according to assessing the L&D function, you realize oh, there's a gap there. We how can we possibly go to a a client and make a recommendation for something that we haven't actually considered the cost for? Yeah, it's good for you. Yes, it's aligned for your your uh, organizational or or your business uh, objectives, or in our in our sense, the requirements that the customer has provided to us, um, and we're recommending it. And this is the best way possible. But you know, I have no I have no idea how much it's going to cost you. So you're off you're off on your own. Well, that's not fair. It's just <laughs> it's yeah. poor practice. Yeah. So um, yeah. So I I, I guess. Uh, um, well, what I like about that is that you, you I, what I heard there is that you've taken perhaps a cost benefit model from elsewhere in your company and basically used it or, or, or adapted uh, that to your needs. And that just makes it easier for those who understand the other model, the original model, the parent model. They understand these children are derivatives that they can see, oh yeah, no, I get it, I understand that. It's not, you know, smoke and mirrors where you're using something that's familiar to either internal folks or to the end customer. Oh, we've talked about this before. I think is is uh, just the the the, um, the the concept of having stage gates, right? So you yeah. you use uh, I can't remember what the term gate review used. meetings, yeah, from the quality gate, gate review meetings, right? Yeah. T totally aligned to to any kind of engineering or manufacturing company, yep. right? So these these gate review meetings are they're they're not necessarily something that I was used to from my my previous experience. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that's not to say that some folks in the in the Canadian Armed Forces and the training development world aren't using these things, because I'm sure they are. I just I never had used them before. Um, so I, I you know. I, I, I come to this company, which is a very you know engineering related company, both ourselves and the and the shipbuilding portion of it. Um, and uh, you know, so what we've we've instituted a process of of gate reviews. We we use a we we have a technology solution. Um, we use Azure DevOps to to manage our our projects. Uh, we uh, have you heard uh, Azure DevOps is a bit like. Uh, 
I'm, I'm going to undersell it here, but you know, like Trello or any of those things that right. you use can Kanban boards, yep. things like that. Yep. Uh, Azure DevOps has a whole other side to it that is that is is quite useful. But so in our processes, we've instituted, um, we we've kind of overlaid um, uh, our, our 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 training design development model. Uh, or if you will, you know, if you looked at your at your your MCD phases, that's kind of what we've overlaid onto this Azure DevOps, and we've instituted our stage gates at certain areas. So when when our folks are working through something like an analysis, or or they're going into say a, a design or development mode, they literally move the tile off the Kanban board, and there's automated emails that go to people. And and if if we're at a stage gate review, then those people are notified, and our senior instructional systems designers will then will then step in and perform that review. That language, that process is completely understood by the rest of the company. Yeah. That it is a it is a normal thing. It's completely normalized. It's not something that that is groundbreaking or it's going to shock the heck out of people. There's another thing I'll go back to Addy, you know. So so if you if you talk about the this 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 Addy model, I think people get maybe scared or they go, oh geez, I don't want to talk about that. I've spoken to trainers before. You know, those go, those guys can just keep their little model and have fun over there. But when you when you when you kind of ditch that model and you 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 adopt the either the curriculum architecture level or the or the modular uh, level, and you put it in the language that the company understands, it just it just becomes so much easier to even have a conversation with somebody about what you're doing. Yeah, uh, I've always I've always thought of those two models as kind of representing a new product development model for instruction training and 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 job aids or performance guides and mm -hmm. because most of my clients were technical uh i worked for motorola they were a technical company they had a new product development process um it, actually they had several because not everybody had gone, gone to one at that point but it, but the whole quality movement was about reducing variation in products by reducing variation in the process. So standard processes that were, you know, as rigorous as required or as flexible as feasible or necessary. So there's so there's some things that are absolute and you need to do it exactly this way. And there's other things where there's more flexibility to be situationally appropriate. But the language of engineering in, a, in an engineering company is, yeah, don't use your analysis term, use requirements or whatever term they're using because they have a language for that. And you're so simply doing something to produce an instructional product where they're trying to produce other types of products. And they may have one or more different models for, to articulate how they do that at a, at a systems engineering level and at a bench level of engineering those are the two equivalents that I that I had learned at Motorola and kind of uh, 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 thought about, you know, instructional design and development methodologies in kind of those terms. So, Brad, let me shift us into the third thing I think you were going to talk about, which was uh, what one of the aspects of analysis that I do in my phase two in both my curriculum architecture design or instructional architecture and in my modular curriculum development or instructional development models, phase two is always analysis. So mm -hmm. can you share with us a little bit about what you might have adopted and adapted in regards to what I've written about analysis? Sure. Yeah, so so uh, I, I mentioned before about folks who bring so many different aspects, uh, skills and experience to the team. Uh, I do find that a lot of us, it's human nature. We, you're faced with any problem. You want to, you want to find a solution. You want to get into execution really quickly. And I, I, it's funny. My wife and I talk about. She works for the Nova Scotia provincial government. We talk about this all the time. You know, you, you gotta, you gotta take a step back. You gotta, you gotta analyze something and use, use some good tools. So, so I find, uh, I find that we all tend to do that, especially in, in, in training in the, in the instructional or training or, or performance kind of world. Uh, MCD phase two, you have in one of your books, the, um, you know, the, the table for performance model and the process that you described. Uh, so I, we were faced with a, a, a small project, I'll say, uh, earlier on, uh, we don't just do training for ships. We do some internal L and D and some other things. So, 
Uh, and and I said, you know, we, we're going to give this a try. We're going to we're actually going to kind of put this in place and go through it and figure it out. And um, and it was tough. It was tough because because of everything I said and because you're dealing with really smart people. I mean, everyone has some really incredibly intellectually sound people on their team. Uh, I had a bunch of people saying, well, you know, we don't really do it that way. And that's not really what I'm used to. And, and how about this? And how about that? And I thought, that's great. But I really want to try this because it's good, right? <laughs> and so we we kind of put it in place and we kind of mish, mishmashed it around. I, I, I've, I've used in the past uh, the behavior, behavioral engineering model for, for a number of analyses. I find it works well, um, but it doesn't necessarily get you down to the detail, the level of detail you need to get in the and the performance modeling activity, which really talks about specific tasks and roles and, and helps identify performance, performance gaps. So can I say that we've adapted or adopted this yet? No, I cannot. We have not done either. Have we tried applying it? Absolutely we have. Have we learned some lessons from it? 100% we have. Um, is my team fully uh, uh, gonna, gonna use it? No. Are we gonna, are we gonna use the BEM? No. So I've had a, f a few folks who of their own volition have developed a, uh, an analysis kind of, kind of process for us. And uh, at this stage of making this video, I have not read it yet. They're developing it. It incorporates a whole bunch of different things and they're gonna present it to me and we're gonna, we're gonna see, see where that goes. So, uh, so maybe in the future, I can report back to the audience <laughs> way how much has been adapted or adopted. The real point is, is if, if anyone out there is listening to this video while they're watching this video and is struggling with analysis, I highly, highly recommend that you dig into, uh, in particular, your writing guy on MCD phase two, look at the table and the process associated with filling out that table. It, 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 I can't guarantee it's going to fit everyone's business context, but it's certainly going to help you along the path to getting to success. Well, yeah, thank you. And I need to give some credit here where, where some of this, my methodology came from. In analysis, I do target audience analysis. You know, who are they? What's the body count? Where are they distributed? What's their performance contexts? What are their learning contexts? You know, what do they have a little room to go to or they have to do it out on the top of a utility pole or where do they do their learning mm -hmm. um, and where do they do their performance? Um, and the second part is the performance analysis. So I, I learned uh, a derivative of a derivative of a Gary Rumler methodology. And uh, the people that I went to work for right out of college had worked with Gary Rumler's brother at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Detroit. And they were kind of a, the uh, laboratory of both uh, Rumler and Gilbert, Tom Gilbert, who had the behavior engineering model. So one mm -hmm. of the things that I have in my files is a thing called a performance table, which I converted to performance model. And actually others uh, with me converted it, the, t the name of this to a performance model. And it identifies, you know, what are the outputs? How do you measure one? How do you know a good one from a bad one? Because the one of the things that I learned from Gilbert and Rumler uh, from 19, 1972 workshop materials was the focus on accomplishments, which was what Gilbert's term was, or outputs, which was the term Rumler used. And so the two of them kind of used accomplishments and outputs. And that's the result of behaviors, of knowledge and skills, of task performance, of behavioral tasks that you can see, cognitive tasks that you can't see, it's the thinking tasks. And so it was always focused on, you know, what are people producing and, and what are the measures for those things? And so I've adapted a lot of stuff from, from Gary Rumler, uh, adopted some and adapted most of it, the, particularly changing some of the language and all of that to create something that I could use to make sure that I was focused on performance and the outputs and the tasks of performance. And then, and then I, the second, third thing, part of my analysis are the enabling knowledge and skills. Mm -hmm. And that all comes from Gilbert's knowledge map. And that was in his book, his 1978 book, Human Competence, which came out the year before I got in the business. And but the people that I went to work for had a different version of a knowledge map that that they had created and been using at training uh, 
uh, development efforts at Blue Cross Blue Shield in Detroit. And it basically uh, framed, you know, what, are, what about knowledge? You know, if you understand the outputs and the tasks, what about the knowledge level? What do people need to know in order to be able to do, in order to be able to produce outputs? And so all of my analysis uh, approaches basically come from Rumler and Gilbert. And they were partners at a company called Praxis back in the 1970s. And, and they'd both been practicing these things before coming together as a consulting firm back in the 60s. So all of this stuff goes way back. And there's many different practitioners who have used and, and adopted and adapted uh, methods from Rumler and Gilbert and others like Bob Mager and such. So I was learning from Magers and Harlesses and all those and putting those together in mind. So the credit for how I do performance analysis really goes to a lot of other people. Um, and then a lot of the design things as well, other than the curriculum architecture thing, which I think I, I kind of created. But I'm sure there were other versions of that. And other people have done that too. Joe mm -hmm. Harless had his approach to curriculum architecture. Um, I, I created my first one in 81, and I don't know how far his goes back. You know, Most of the time to have learned from some of these masters, you had to go to their workshops they weren't producing books yeah. and giving this away for the price of a book. You'd have to go to their workshop and get fully trained in doing this because I think one issue is that if you if somebody read a book, if Guy read one of their books and then went out and misapplied it because he didn't really understand it, it would reflect poorly on them. So I think that they always wanted you to go to their workshops so they could really hone your skills and hammer something into you if it was you know slow in coming. Um, yeah. But uh, so so when you did this performance analysis uh, stuff and and, you know, your people, it is different. It's a different approach to a lot of uh, the instructional analysis efforts that that I've witnessed over the past 40 some years. But but don't hold your people, you know, it, whatever works for you, if your people come up with something and it works and it leads to the design and development of instruction that really helps people learn how to do their jobs well that's the goal it's not you know yeah. adopting something it's adapting from many multiple sources i think is important it's absolutely it's absolutely adapting from many multiple sources and i think whether we realize it or not i mean you you have kind of a bit of an encyclopedic uh memory i think and you can kind of recite all of these names and places and stuff if you're if if, if other folks out there are watching this video and they're like me they just i don't know where i know this stuff i just knew it from somewhere Yep. <laughs> then, then that's fine. And that's what people do. So, you know, we got folks on our team that have done bachelors of education or other folks that have done some different, different uh, certificate programs or diploma programs. They may not even know where they're coming, where this information is coming from, but they're building it. I, I, we should talk a little bit about, about, you know, workshops, books, and then the plethora of information out there on the internet. They're, 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 I, I like doing this type of video with someone like yourself, because we're, we're talking about work that someone's actually, you know, put time and effort into and, and you've aggregated a bunch of stuff and analyzed a bunch of work and experience for other people. And I have, and, and so we talk about it. There's a host of stuff out there on the internet, half of which I wouldn't trust as far as I can throw it. There's some, some great folks out there on the internet, like, like Will Thalheimer and his, it, what I think we used to be called the debunkers club and other things that were they're They're kind of, you know, sort, sorting out the wheat from the chaff, so to speak. One of the reasons I like, I guess I'm old fashioned. I'll just show you here. You know, I mean, I, I like books. This just happens to be one of yours, but you know, I, I still use flag, flags and sticky yep. tape. And, and, and so I, you know, I'll go, oh, there you go. Look at that. There's a lesson map that was important to me. So I flagged it and I've got, you know, any number of books here, you know, engineering, what is this, you know, engineering toolkit by Goodell, Jim Goodell. It's a great read evidence informed design. Uh, by Neilan and Kirshner and a bunch of others that are all flagged up and you kind of I can go to my my reading area and kind of read and refer to them whereas if you're if you're relying on internet sources you really got to be careful of what you're looking at and make sure that it's rooted in in the science or the evidence right so um yeah if there's other another recommendation I can I can make to folks is, is and I know I know professionals do this every day but uh I wish I had an encyclopedic mind like you <laughs> well, you, you know, you're, so I'm a gray beard. You've got some gray in your beard as well. And so, so I, I, I have to tell you that, you know, so I, I was telling this story the other day and I used to use Tom Gilbert's 
language for, he used the word exemplar. And so I had read the human competence book back starting back in 1979. It was one of the first three, I was given three things on day one, you know, a, a newsletter from Rumler and Gilbert, their Praxis newsletter from 1970 that talked about guidance, which back in 1979, when I first read that, those were more popularly known as, as job aids. Nowadays, mm -hmm. it's performance support and a whole bunch of other names, and I call it performance guidance, because I could get a map that's a performance support item. It doesn't tell me what to do. So performance guidance tells you how to perform. It's step-by-step, -step, et cetera. And I was given Bob Mager and Peter Pipe's book, Analyzing Performance Problems, which really... Uh, set me on fire. I read it my very first night at back at the hotel in my new job, you know, several hundred miles away from where I had just come from. And then I started digging into human competence. Um, but, but so we, you know, so, you know, it's important. So it's important to, so, so my story was, so I used the word exemplar in front of a bunch of manufacturing operations managers at Motorola. And the head guy in a room full of 30 of them stopped me when I said the word exemplar. And he said, guy, we hate that word. That's a $3 college word. And we are the belch, fart, and scratch crowd at Motorola. You know, different mm -hmm. than all those degreed engineers, you know, that make up all of management ranks at Motorola. Anyway, so I was dealing with the salt of the earth. And, and I said, well you don't like exemplar. So how about master performer? And they said, yeah, that'll work. And so that's what I started using. And I've been using that now for 40 some years. About three years ago, I was going through my metal file cabinets, deciding what to digitize in my paper files. And I came across an article by Dale Brethauer, who was the best friend of Gary Rumler back at the University of Michigan back in the 50s and 60s. And right there in the first paragraph was the phrase, master performer. So I used Breath Hour's master performance phrase for 40, almost 40 years before I realized, where did I get that from? So yeah. I may, it may appear that I have this encyclopedic knowledge of all of this, <laughs> and I don't. I just remember some of the key things, but I have learned yeah. and borrowed from so many people. And to me, not being an academic, being a practitioner, I was not concerned with, you know, how to, what to cite, who to cite and what, you know, when did that come out and where? No, I just took it and either adopted it or adapted it and folded it into my methodologies mm -hmm. and started using it. And I've lost track of the original sources for, I'm sure, most of my things. And, and but I've been encouraging people of late, you know, to adopt what you can and adapt yeah. the rest, because that's really what you're going to need to do because you can't take my language and use it as is. You need to figure out what's the equivalent in my context and convert mm -hmm. that language so that it resonates with your customer because they don't want to know how you make the sausage. They just want to know that you make the sausage and how you go about it is somewhat familiar to them so that they can you know, check in at the appropriate point if you're not offering them eight review meetings or such. In a way, you kind of have to have this kind of metacognitive level of understanding of what you are adapting and adopting. You don't have to be encyclopedic or academic about it, but you do have to understand, okay, I've, I've taken this, I've adapted, I've changed it a little bit. And the reason I say that is because <clears throat> you never, in our business, you never want to get into the, the business of inadvertently um, thinking that you're selling something that is positive, or you're, really you're selling snake oil. And you can get into that trap if yeah. you're not at least somewhat cognizant of whose work you're relying on, or maybe what model you may have seen in the past. So I guess I'm contradicting myself from what I said a few, a few minutes ago of saying, hey, I don't really know where I got that from, but I, I learned it somewhere. Really, you, there, you, you kind of owe yourself a little bit of, of responsibility to, to think about it, take some time to think about it. Um, you know, maybe, uh, maybe, you know, maybe have a conversation like this with someone on your team, that this conversation that yeah. you and I are having, you know, what have you adopted? What have you adopted? Uh, 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 adapted or adopted um because of course yeah if if you if you if you accidentally sell someone snake oil you shouldn't do it on purpose that's for sure ever right. <laughs> you might right. accidentally sell someone snake oil you're not you're not meeting their organizational objectives or yours and you're not going to meet the requirements it's going to get you in hot water that's for sure yeah i used to rely on my professional uh, association uh nsbi mm -hmm. the national society for 
programmed instruction that became performance and instruction that became performance improvement. And now it's ISPI, the International Society for Performance Improvement. Mm -hmm. But I, at the annual conference and at the local chapter meetings, I would hear what's right, correct, or valid, and what's not. And at the NSPI conferences back in the 80s, there were two people in particular, um, Claude Lineberry and, um, um, oh, I'm blanking on Bob Carlton. And Bob Carlton, and they used to plant themselves on opposite ends of the audience. And they had scoured the program and they thought, we're going to go to this session here and, you know, take exception to what they're going to say because we can tell by the description here that this is this is baloney and one yeah. of them would stand up in the middle of the presenter's spiel and say do you have any data to back that up and the oh, other ouch. person on the other side of the audience would stand up and say and data is plural and that was my signal that what i had just heard was probably not valid, was snake oil, was a misrepresentation or some marketing spiel. And, and that helped me tremendously. So ISPI, I was on the board in 99 and 2000. And, and because of those two people in particular, ISPI had developed a, a reputation for not being friendly to presenters. And they got a lot of complaints and they asked these people to tone it down and not do that. And when I was on the board and heard that, that we were asking them to tone it down, I said, no, this is our screen. This is our validity check here. And if it wasn't for people like that, I might have been misled. And, and now in today's world, I think it's important that you figure out who is really citing evidence-based, research-based, it was the phrase from back in the day, um, and, and basically understands what's valid and what's not. And not just what's valid, you know, every time under the sun, but under what conditions is this valid or under what conditions is this invalid? Because not everything is valid in all situations and circumstances. And so yeah. figuring out those nuances, that's the challenge for people climbing the learning and performance curves in our business as in anywhere else. But so we need Will Tallheimers and Patty Shanks and and Miriam Nealon and Paul Kirshner and and Richard E. Clark and Ruth Clark and uh, and Richard Mayer and lots and lots and lots and lots of other people who really are helping to uh, guide us into um, approaches to things that really have validity that really that aren't going to lead you into the ditch and when you're new. That's really critical that you have that kind of guidance. I have a slew of mentors that I learned from and from NSPI and from the quality movement, um, the Durans and Demings from the quality movement and a lot of other practitioners that I met and worked with at Motorola. So I kind of got that early, you know, alignment to things that seemed to be valid and were data based, had data to validate yeah. them. And, and that's, I think, the challenge for a lot of people is. You know, uh, there are there are hundreds, if not thousands of ways to do something right. There are millions of ways to do it wrong. All you have to do is find one of the right routes. You know, yeah. there's more than one uh, way to do these <clears throat> things. And I think for, for your team, you don't have to adopt how I do things. You need to find some way that actually works, a proven process, a proven practice that gives you the kind of measurable results mm -hmm. that you're looking for in your business. And I would just add one little caveat to that. Sometimes you might find something that is brand new. Just be upfront about it. Be upfront with your client, with your organization, and your team. So we we are right now at this, I would say, these opening days of how AI is going to revolutionize yep. everything we do. There's a lot of people out there telling us what AI can and can't do. Uh, I On Monday, I'm participating in a panel talk with the Canadian Armed Forces IT and E crowd with uh, Lockheed Martin and Accenture. So we're part of this panel. And I'm going to be up front as I am being with you now. We may not know any of this stuff right now. We think we know what we're doing. Let's just be up front and say we don't. There are certain people who are doing certain technological things with AI. Absolutely. What's going to be the true impact of AI on learning, on training, on instruction? If anyone says they know, they're full of baloney. So let's just be up front about it. We don't know. The evidence, the body of evidence isn't there yet. Say it. And then just let's go and figure it out together. So we've got all of this behind us. You've mentioned models from the 60s 
70s, 80s, and, and now, and there's going to be new models. Uh, and I'm, to be frank with you, I'm, I'm damn well excited about what's going to happen in the next kind of 10 or 20 years in our field. That's for sure. Yeah. And that, you know, so let me bring us back to the clock face model. At 11 yeah. o'clock is the research and development of uh, performance-based instruction, training, learning, whatever you want to call it, whatever you need to call it. And so as new things, new tools and techniques come into play, we need to experiment it with them. We need to not, and not do it on the highest risk effort that we have unless everybody agrees that, yeah, we should do this. Uh, because the potential benefit. But so we need controlled experiments of new things to see how that plays out, to see what we can learn from them, to see if and when, how we might incorporate those into our philosophies and our processes mm -hmm. and our practices. And AI is just a, a beautiful one. Now, Richard E. Clark was working on uh, using artificial intelligence to do cognitive task analysis. And it's an effort that's kind of gone. Uh, he, he's retired, and and the back at Southern California University, the people who were doing that kind of went in a different direction, and and so I don't know where that stands, but but there was promise, there was uh, hope that that artificial intelligence could interview experts and sort. Uh, you know, the issue is that you know you and I, any expert, any person on the planet can explain about 30% of what it is that they're thinking yeah. about what they're doing. And so you interview a single source SME, they're going to give you 30% of what the novice needs. And so you need to talk to multiple experts and, and, and combine what you get because everybody knows a different 30%. Um, and, and is missing a, a different 70%. So if you do enough interviews, he says five or so, um, you basically get up to about 85% of completeness of your content that can guide performance of a novice. And so artificial intelligence, I'm waiting for artificial intelligence not to give me all the content in the world, but to first do the analysis of what's yeah. the outputs to be produced, what are the tasks to be performed, what do you gotta know and if they can begin to get that from experts who are currently doing operating at a level of mastery, well, then we can figure out, well, what content fits that? And we can screen content that, you know, we, we need to get to the essential content and screen out all the extraneous content because the last thing learners needs is boatloads of content. And, and in a way that allows us in this profession to operate uh, at, a, at a higher level because we're now uh, applying our experience and our expertise and intellect at, at the higher level tasks, not, not quite frankly, some of the most boring tasks, which is like interviewing people, right? I mean, it's great because you get to know a lot of people and, and, and you get to know the job they're doing even better. But if that can be, if that can be uh, you know, come to you either using natural language processing or, or another kind of uh, AI applied in a different way, then we can really get down to okay, let's let's get down to the the, the higher level uh, uh, analysis of this information. So it is it is exciting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, technology. You know, it's wonderful when it works. But that's to me, you know, and this is an overgeneralization, probably not true in, in specific situations. But in the forty some years that I've been in the business, the only thing that's really changed is the technology that enables us to do our work, uh, to deploy our work and to administrate our work. And, uh, and there are new things that are being learned about in the learning sciences, et cetera, that, that will have impact on, on what we do. So we've just got to have, you know, have a watchful eye towards that. And that needs to be deliberate. We need to be scanning and scouring the new things that are coming down the pike and deciding when and how, or should we even play with this a little bit and learn from it and then to see if it's something we should incorporate or not. Um, Brad, let me bring this to a close by asking you, so, so what advice do you have for our audience regarding, you know, not just adopting or adapting from me and, and other sources, but so what guidance would you give your team or to other people elsewhere that are not necessarily new to learning and development, but, but are new to a performance orientation approach and a more working at a more strategic level? Mm-hmm. Um, at a more strategic level. Okay. Well, uh, I think the first thing would be, uh, if you've, let's say, let's say I'll go with trust yourself. Okay. So, um, 
we've talked a lot about referencing folks and, and, and the fact that we stand on the shoulders of giants or, or however that saying goes. Um, and if you are, if, if, if you've earned your way into a position through your experience and your qualifications to, to be lucky enough, absolutely lucky enough to lead a team doing any form of learning development or working on performance or, or if it's pure training or education, you need to be able to trust yourself and what you're doing. So, uh, you, uh, so that's number one. Um, number two, uh, and I think this one just occurred to me a few minutes ago when we were talking is, is take some time to, with your team, whether that be, uh, you and maybe your immediate deputy or, or your whole team, if it's a small team and have this conversation, have this conversation. What have you adapted? What have you adopted? Take some time to think about that. That's kind of the metacognitive level is think about what you're thinking about. So trust yourself. Build on that trust through having a conversation like this and keep having a conversation. And I guess the, the third part, and if my team's listening, which I hope you are, trust your team. So if you've, if you've gathered yourself, if you've gathered around you uh, the experts, even if you don't have enough yet or maybe you need a couple of different kinds of experts, trust your team. And, and if, if they're doing the first two things as well, trusting themselves, and having that conversation about what, what they've adapted or adopted, you cannot possibly go wrong. And if I'm allowed a fourth point, it is orient everything you're doing to the organizational and the business needs of, of your organization. Uh, it, it absolutely has to be oriented that way. There are things that you can do to help people, to train people, to do whatever. But if it isn't absolutely zeroed in on your organization, whether that be a private business or if you're, if, you know, I know, I think some some folks from my former life might be listening right now. Is that it? You know, it, it, in a military sense, you know, the performance of your fighting forces or whatever it may be. If it's not absolutely oriented to that goal, then you're probably doing something wrong. Yeah. So there's my advice. Well, excellent. Thank Brad. Thank you so much for sharing with us today. And uh, uh, you and I at least can have a private conversation sometime in the future about. Uh, where you're getting to on all of this, but uh, uh, best wishes to you and your team in uh, impacting performance in a measurable way. Thank you, Guy. And as always, it's been a pleasure. I love having these conversations with you and uh, I look forward to, to more conversations. All right. You have a great day. You too. Bye. Bye.